Our scripture this morning is taken from John 15, 12 through 17. And I'm reading from the NLT. I command you to love each other in the same way that I love you. And here is how to measure it. The greatest love is shown when people lay down their lives for their friends. You are my friends if you obey me. I no longer call you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce good fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. I command you to love each other. So I just know that somebody came to church today to hear Hush. Seven guys, wherever you are, thank you for singing Hush. Somebody came to church today to hear Away in the Manger. Because we only hush amid our trials when we look at the baby in the manger. And somebody came here today to hear about peace in the valley. Is that you? Where do you find that peace in this valley? Looking at the manger. Thank you for the, all this great music. And uh, God is great. Now, if you don't like the way my voice sounds today, I am trying hard to be in fashion joining the rest of you. For the last five weeks, I've heard people talk like I talk, so I'm going to do the same as you, except the accent won't change. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I'm so thankful for every person that is here today, but I'm thankful most of all for you, your Holy Spirit, who is here to take the Word of God and to make it not just plain, but to make it real. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you don't like this question, but I'm going to ask it for you anyway. Which would you rather be? Which would you rather be? A loving atheist or a mean Adventist? Which would you rather be? A kind Muslim or a cruel Christian? Now, we have a cool Christian here, cool, but what about a cruel Christian? You don't like those options? Thank God there are better options, right? But which of those do you think God would like you to be? Jesus apparently placed a whole lot more emphasis, a whole lot more emphasis on his followers being kind than his followers being right. How do we know? When Jesus had his final opportunity to be with his 12 disciples, his final opportunity before he died. Oh my, this is a wife in the million. When do you say thank you to Elvira? Thank you. Thank you. You mind? If that makes you thirsty, I'm sorry. Here's Jesus, his last opportunity to be with his disciples. He's going to die soon. What do you think he would choose to talk to them about? Last opportunity. He spent three and a half years doing all kinds of things, teaching them all kinds of things. This is his last opportunity. What do you think he would choose to talk to them about? Obviously, it's going to be what is most important to him. Would he give them a step-by-step -step explanation of the crisis ahead? No. Nope. Would he outline for them all the false teachings they would have to encounter? No. Would he list for them 
that which should make his followers stand out in the world above all people. Yes. Except it was not a list, it was only one thing. Do you know what it was? Only one thing. What was that? This final conversation with his 12 close friends begins in John chapter 13. You may want to turn there. We're going to talk about that for a while. And it stretches all the way from John 13 all the way to the end of John 16. Those are four chapters, one conversation. And it consists of 130, one, three, zero verses. And when you read all 130 verses, there is one word that is used most of all above everything else. And what word do you think that might be? Love. 28 times in those 130 verses, Jesus is talking about love and especially loving one another. I want you to get it, folks, because here is Jesus choosing to talk about that which is most important to him. And it's about his followers loving one another. 28 times. And while Jesus is talking about loving one another in this long conversation, Peter interrupts him. He's got something else in his mind. He says, Jesus, where are you going? Out of, out of character. I mean, it's not even what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about loving one another. Peter comes up with, hey, Jesus, by the way, question. Uh, where, where are you going? And Peter is quickly joined by Philip, who says, well, tell us the way to go where you are going. And Philip has hardly said that when uh, he is joined by, I'm sorry, that was Thomas. Why didn't anybody tell me that? It's Thomas. Because Philip is the next one, and he comes up and says, show us the Father. Jesus is talking about loving one another, the final thing that he can say to them, and these three guys are more interested in knowledge than loving one another. They're more interested in having the right knowledge, being right and they are interested in what is uppermost in Jesus' mind. Take some time. Read those four chapters. Circle. Point out every time you see the word love. And then you see these interruptions that come in. And Jesus, very courteously, he accommodates their sidetracking. He doesn't ignore it. He, he addresses it briefly. But then he comes all the way back again to loving one another. He says in John 14, 15, If you love me, obey my commandments. And the only commandment Jesus gave them in John 13 in this conversation is the commandment, love one another as I have loved you. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. It's the only time in that whole conversation he's talking about a commandment. So when he says, if you love me, keep my commandments, what commandment is he talking about? Well, you know that the last six is summarized as loving one another, isn't it? So Jesus is referring here to a commandment of loving one another. And whenever Jesus speaks about obedience in this conversation, whenever he speaks about the Holy Spirit, whenever he talks about the crisis ahead, he's always doing it linked to loving one another. As as if Jesus knew that the time would come when the church would focus on things like the Holy Spirit. They would focus on things like the crisis. They will focus on things like obedience and leave out loving one another. That's why Jesus links it. Because loving one another for Jesus is more important than any of the others unless you get them all together. Nothing matters until the followers of Jesus love each other. That at least was on Jesus' mind. 
So why do you think Jesus keeps repeating this? Why does he keep on talking about loving one another? Here he goes, four chapters, 130 verses, and he is repeating it over and over and over. Why does he do that? Well, because obviously his followers did not love each other. That's very obvious as you read the story. There were barriers. There were walls between them. It's like the Romans at that very time. They actually built a wall in the Roman Empire that they wanted to reach all the way down to the Black Sea in order for this wall to indicate the boundary, the frontier of of the Roman Empire, but also to keep the barbarians out. This wall was so immense, the stones used were so huge, the task was so amazing that people actually believed that that wall was built by the devil. Well, the devil didn't build that wall. But you know as well as I do that the devil does build walls today. He builds walls between people. Walls, economic walls, religious walls, cultural walls, opinion walls, differences, arguments, opinions that are different. Walls that are erected by the devil between people because that's how he knows he can make ineffective anything that we teach that is truth. Walls, walls, walls. Walls of unforgiveness. Walls of disagreement. Walls of anger. How did Jesus break down those walls? How did Jesus break down those walls? Now, their relationship with each other was based on how they were treated. I'll be nice to you if you're nice to me. And if you see things different to the way I see them, then I'm going to treat you coldly. I'm just going to ignore you. I'm going to write you off. Those are the walls. If you hurt me, I will get even. You see, the basis upon which the followers of Jesus at that time, apparently, and maybe some today, the basis upon which they related to each other was how they were treated by someone else. And they would reciprocate and do back to them what was done to them. Jesus comes along and he says, "Uh -uh -uh. I got a totally different basis for how you are to relate to each other. I have a very different basis. I mean, you may even get yourself to the place where you choose, well, because I'm a Christian, I've got to be nice, I've got to be kind, so I'll be kind as necessary, kind of minimums. Jesus has a different basis. His basis is be kinder than necessary. In other words, it isn't based on how I am treated by you. It's rather based on how I am treated by Jesus. That's the basis on how Jesus wants us to treat one another. I treat you the way Jesus treats me, which has got nothing to do with how you des- what you deserve. It has nothing to do with how mean you choose to be to me. I am to treat you the way Jesus treats me. And how many of you actually do that all week long? Yeah, me too. My hands are at my side. That's why Jesus said in John 15, 12, this is my commandment. Do you want to know what my commandment is? Final speech, here it is. My commandment is love each other in the same way I have loved you. So now my question is, did Jesus succeed in getting his followers to love each other the way he loved them? Did he succeed in getting it done? Did that happen among his followers? I like to tell you about Jerome, born 347 A.D., a man who knew John, the writer of the gospel and the book of Revelation and the letters, John, the disciple. He knew him personally. No, he didn't know him personally. He knew him so well because he read all about him. He read what his followers said about him. He was so interested in John. This is what Jerome said. 
He says that whenever John the Apostle was carried into an assembly at his old age, he was unable to walk. He was so old, this man was carried into the assemblies where the Christians were, and every time he was brought into an assembly, Jerome said, John would say to the people, little children, love one another. Every time. And when his supporters got tired of hearing the same thing over and over again, they said, John, why do you always say this? John's reply is, it is the Lord's commandment. If this alone be done, it is enough. That is not an apocryphal story, friends. That is historically accurate. Jerome is a trusted author. If that's all you get done, is to love one another as Jesus loved you, that's enough. Eusebius, an historian, tells of a man who fell away from Christianity. And when John got hold of him, he pled with him to repent and come back and follow Jesus. And John said to this man, If it must be, I will willingly suffer your death as the Lord suffered for us. For your life I will give my own. John got it. Here is my commandment. You must love each other the same way as I love you. That was primary. That's why you read the Gospel of John and you read his letters, even the book of Revelation. It's constantly about love. Constantly. Constantly. You know, in those earliest centuries of the Christian faith, this love of Jesus was the hallmark of the Christian community. In fact, the pagans went around talking about the Christians, and Tertullian reports that this is what the pagans said about the Christians. See how they love one another, how they are ready even to die for one another. Early Christians. You see, before, and here is another man, Dodds, he's a, a writer here in the 1960s, and in his research, he comes up with this conclusion where he thinks that the genuine love and the unity among Christians was perhaps, he says, the strongest single cause for the spread of Christianity in those early centuries. And of course, before Constantine, the emperor of Rome. When one became a Christian, there was no question but that death to self, death to self, was involved in being a Christian. Everybody becoming a Christian knew that one thing that's going to happen to me is I'm going to die to self. Self-denial is going to be my way of life so that I can love others. But after Constantine, things changed in the Christian church. That's when self became important so that one preacher by the name of Chrysostom, preaching in the 4th century, he actually chastises his congregation for the lack of love. And here's what his sermon consisted of. He said, there is nothing else that causes non-Christians to stumble except that there is no love among Christians. We are the cause of their remaining in error, he says. Their own doctrines, they have long condemned. They've condemned their own doctrines, and in like manner, they admire our Christian doctrines, but they are hindered by our mode of life. And there are many Christian leaders out in the world today that tell us that in those parts of the world today where Christianity is struggling to take a root, it is because they say the biggest obstacle of people coming to Jesus is when they look at Christians and they decide, we don't want any of that. Take, for example, 
a man of our time. His name is Sam Harris. Sam Harris is one of the modern new atheists, very popular, very influential. His writings are 14th from the top on Amazon. Sam Harris, very influential atheist, just behind the other one called Richard Dawkins, who wrote the book, The God Delusion. These men are influential. Their books are selling better than any Christian books out there. Let me tell you, these men are doing damage. Doing damage. And this man, Sam Harris, wrote a letter to a publication called Christian Nation not too long ago. And I want you to hear a little bit of the letter that he wrote. He's a major atheist, major influential man. Here's what he writes in his letter. He says, Thousands of people have written to tell me that I am wrong not to believe God. Would you write him a letter like that? You're wrong not to believe in God, Mr. Sam Harris. And then he says, the most hostile of these communications have come from Christians. And this is ironic because as Christians generally imagine that no faith imparts the virtues of love and forgiveness more effectively than their own religion of Christianity. But the truth is that many who claim to be transformed by Christ's love are deeply and sometimes murderously intolerant of criticism. I'm about to say something that's going to tramp on somebody's toe. And that just woke you up. Great. But in this recent political campaign that is just over, uh, maybe you noticed how it revealed plenty of hate-filled expressions from professing Christians, believing that they're doing the Lord's work, believing they're doing their Christian duty. Hate-filled expressions. And the non-Christian world watches, and the non-Christian world decides that kind of Christianity not for me. Apparently, the followers of Jesus generally today are not doing very well at loving one another in the same way Jesus loved them. Not doing very well in obeying the command of their Lord to love one another as Jesus loved them. How did Jesus treat his enemies while they crucified him, while they were mocking him, spitting at him, while they were totally opposed to him in every way? He hangs on the cross and pleads for their forgiveness. Let me tell you, friends, I really only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. So my attitude towards you reflects on my attitude towards God. Have you ever seen that little coffee table book called Life's Little Instruction Book? Eh, kind of seen that book around. It has a subtitle, it says 511 suggestions and observations and reminders of how to live a happy and rewarding life. You know what number 173 says? It says, be kinder than necessary. Kind of nice, you know, but Jesus doesn't come to us yet today and say, okay, here's my advice to you. I want to just nudge you forward so that you would be nicer to each other than necessary. I'm just going to nudge you forward with a command because Jesus goes beyond that. You're in John chapter 15, part of the same conversation. Jesus talks about us. In order for us to love one another as he loves us, he talks about us remaining in him. I've heard so many people use that verse, talking about the vine and the branches. 
saying that we should remain in Jesus, never mentioning that the purpose of Jesus saying that was because he knew that's the only way we could obey his command of loving one another. He says that before chapter 15, he says it later in chapter 15. In fact, 15 verse 12 is his command. Love me, love one another the same as I have loved you. In other words, remaining in Jesus is how we bear the fruit of loving one another. That's the context. The more you take Jesus in, the more you take the love of Jesus in, the more the love of Jesus is going to flow out. Does that make sense? Of course it does. A little book, Mount of Blessing, page 114 through 115. Wonderful reading material. Two weeks ago we read it as a church, as part of our gospel reading. There it says a simple thing, that it is redeeming love, the love of Calvary, the love where salvation was achieved for us on Calvary, where God showed us how much He really loves us. It says there, it is redeeming love flowing into the heart that changes the heart. In other words, we should not be talking about anything until we've talked enough about loving God. Because we take in His love, then His love will flow out from us. We should be repeating the love of God, talking about that sacrificial love in our homes, in our school, in church, everywhere where we are. That's got to be our focus because that's the only way we can remain in the brown, in the vine and have His love flow into us. Otherwise, it will never flow out. What will flow out is love, yes, kindness as necessary, but Jesus wants us to have kindness that is more than necessary. And that only happens when Jesus is inside and he is flowing out. Paul says this in Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, even as God also in Christ forgave you. Right now you need to forgive me because I'm five minutes over. See, I just believe Satan is working so hard. He is working harder than anything, using every kind of deception, using any kind of emphasis in the wrong place in order to distract us from concentrating on the love of Jesus as seen on the cross of Calvary. There is nothing that we should emphasize more than the love of God as seen on Calvary. Because the more we emphasize it, the more we're going to act it out. See, there's a little lady once a while ago went home from church and she uh, met up with her neighbor and told her what happened to her the day before in church. She was visiting there that day, and here's what she said. She said, she said in church, there was a couple in front of us with two very noisy kids. She used a different word than noisy. I'm not going to go there. She said, two pews behind us, there was another couple with two noisy in other words, kids making a huge ruckus. She's a visitor. Here's what she noticed. She said, I noticed that this is mostly an older congregation. She said, they are mostly Norwegians. All apologies to present Norwegians in this company. But I'm Irish and we're the same. And so she said, that means they were pretty staid in their ways. You couldn't budge them. I was, it wasn't a very nice worship service, she said. But afterward, she said, I saw half a dozen of these elderly people come up and put their arms around the mothers and touch the kids and get into a conversation with the kids smiling at them. They could have been irritated, she said, but instead they were kind. And this same church, she said, recently welcomed a, a young woman who had a baby and a little three-year-old. She had never married, but she wanted to come to church to show her children, at least to learn about God's love. And she says, 
four couples in that church are now trying to get together with her and play with the kids regularly. Friends, I'll tell you something. These mothers don't know much about doctrine, but they know a lot about being loved. Some of you have been listening and watching the news this last week. Angus Jones, two and a half men, recently became a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't care what you think about him. I don't care what you think about him before or after he became an Adventist. But there was an interview held with him published this week by Christianity Today. And here's the question. One of the questions asked of Angus Jones. How did you end up attending an African-American church, an Adventist African-American church? How did you end up? Here's what he said. I was going to three or four churches on the weekends looking for a congregation to join. A friend of a friend had gone to the church and a, few week, a few times and he told me about it. And the first time I went there, the message was tailor-made for me. Then the interviewer asked him, what resonated with you there in that church? Word for word, Angus Jones. The spirit of the people. They were so loving, so accepting, it's powerful. I wonder if sometimes our church has become a message-only organization, a knowledge-only, instruction, information-only organization. If all we have is a message, and friends, get it straight, I absolutely believe, I absolutely support, I preach, I teach, I give to everyone I can, because I believe in the accuracy of the Adventist message, but I want to tell you, if all we have is a message, and we don't have love, we clearly don't have enough. Our message, in the absence of Christ's love, is insufficient. Can you imagine the day when the people in this environment will say, hmm, I have rethought my opinion of those Adventists. Because I'll tell you something, what I've just found out about them is that those Adventists are the kindest and most loving people that you will ever know. When that day comes, they'll be willing to listen to you talk about the last day events. When that day comes, they'll be willing to hear you talk about why you keep the Sabbath. But until then, they don't care. And we shouldn't care either. Then we love them until they know we care. Now, I'm excited about the frequent baby and wedding showers that are held in this church by people who actually hold those showers for people who don't even expect it to happen for them. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about people who would come week by week and prepare Sabbath breakfast for high school students. And all the high school students said, here you go. See, I'm excited about people who are willing to do that. Thanks, guys. I did not even coach them. I want you to know that. I'm excited about people who volunteer their time for rescue mission, for open arms, free clinic, interfaith assistance ministry, and several other organization. I'm excited about people who would volunteer their time to go and work there because they're showing love. I'm excited about a team who will put on a, a Christmas party for foster kids with the amount of time and energy and money that goes into that. That is exciting stuff. That is loving people. Hey, that's going beyond being minimally kind. Thank God for them. I'm excited about people who every week would take a vase and put a carnation in it and go and deliver it to a patient in a room in this hospital next door. I'm excited about people doing that. I'm excited about people who would spend their time working with pathfinders and adventurers and GPS and Sabbath school classes and playtime, all this to show love to people. I'm excited about a church who does that. 
And there are many more who go around helping, thinking no one has noticed. They just do it because something has happened in their hearts. And that something is the love of Jesus has overwhelmed them. I'm excited about people like that. In fact, I'll tell you, friends, the more and more that becomes the culture of our church, where there is not a single person who comes here that does not leave unless they have been overwhelmed by love from people they've never met before. But those people know how to put their arms around them, know how to welcome them, know how to ask them what their name is, know how to go back to them, know how to invite them home, and they feel like this is where I belong, Angus Jones again. Because my heart is changed far more by actions of love than my heart is changed by right teachings. And apparently Jesus knows that. That's why he said, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way as I love you.